Although teenagers are often known as troublemakers, they usually stick to storming off angrily or sneaking out at night. However, there are some dangerous teenagers who have taken their audacity to astonishing new levels, committing horrible crimes. Join us as we have a look at the top 15 dangerous teenagers reacting to life in prison. Number 1. Damon Kemp Damon Kemp, a 19-year-old who was accused of taking the lives of his teenage companions, was imprisoned with no hope of freedom. Kemp's response as he was brought into the courtroom for his bond hearing was nothing short of spectacular, generating concern amongst the victim's relatives. The courtroom was tense and tears were seen in the eyes of friends and family members who had been impacted by this awful tragedy. Narissa Carter, who was sitting in the front row, was overtaken with emotion as she lamented the end of her 19-year-old son, Trey Ingram's life, who had been cruelly slain. The grief had grown intolerable, causing her to leave the courtroom for a brief time, a situation familiar to any bereaved mother. Damon Kemp's actions in court aroused concern and heightened the gloomy atmosphere. As the judge read out his accusations and sealed his destiny, he began yelling and invoking a higher power. Kemp's emotions and demeanor were unnerving, adding to the case's already perplexing character. His bail would be rejected by the judge because there was sufficient reasonable cause for his arrest. Trey's family got increasingly outspoken amidst the tears and wailing of Kemp's family and friends, leading their eventual escort out of the courtroom. Kemp had been detained in connection with an armed home invasion, according to the dismal facts. Authorities never revealed the reason for the shooting, leaving both families reeling from the tragic deaths of their loved ones. Number 2. Jacob Morgan Jacob Morgan, a 17-year-old autistic child, could not hold back his sobs as he would be sentenced to 15 years in prison for the horrible events that occurred in March of 2015. Morgan had admitted to lighting a fire that took the life of his 14-month-old half-brother Joshua, his family had stood behind their eldest son all throughout the proceedings, insisting on his innocence. Morgan's mother, Julie Dover, protested his guilt in court while standing by his side in a touching demonstration of parental love. His parents claimed that their son was attempting to re-enter the blazing house to save Joshua, but worried neighbors had stopped him, telling him to keep away from the flames. They claim that Morgan, who has developmental issues and difficulties with basic reading and writing, had confessed to lighting the fire under pressure during a five-hour unrecorded interview. Morgan had provided investigators with various stories of the fire's genesis. He initially claimed that he had inadvertently tossed a pillow near a radiator, but then admitted to intentionally burning a cushion and flinging it into the air. Fire investigators had discovered evidence that two fires had been started, one in the living room and another on a blanket in Joshua's bedroom, where he was sleeping. Prosecutors also said that Morgan had acknowledged being intrigued by fire and had lit another one on the property only two weeks before. They gave police testimony from Morgan, which revealed his fondness for tea candles and a fixation with fire. Number 3. Philip Chisholm in October of 2013, a stunning and unsettling episode took place when Philip Chisholm, a ninth grade student at Danvers High School in Massachusetts, performed a horrible deed that stunned the town. Chisholm, then 14 years old, would savagely assault and take the life of his 24-year-old math teacher, Colleen Ritzer. Ritzer, known for her cheerful demeanor and devotion to her students, had requested Chisholm to remain after school that day unknowing of the terrible plot that he had already put into place. Chisholm followed Ritzer into a bathroom as the school day came to a conclusion, and that's where he subjected her to his awful sufferings. Chisholm would be captured by police the next morning with Ritzer's blood on his hands, as he had made no attempts to wash them. This incriminating evidence would cement his guilt in the eyes of authorities. The judicial processes that followed this horrific occurrence resulted in a life-altering punishment for the juvenile culprit, Philip Chisholm, now a teenager, had received a life sentence with a chance of release after 25 years. The courtroom was full of great emotion. Chisholm himself had looked shocked and was left for no words. During the trial, the victim's father, Tom Ritzer, voiced his tremendous sadness and shame for not being able to defend his daughter. He clearly recalled looking for her at school, inadvertently driving by her in the woods, and the agony of knowing that he couldn't undo what had been done. Number 4 Roxana Sikorsky 
Roxana Sikorsky, then 15 years old, would be sentenced to 10 years in prison for planning to take the lives of her own family. The frightening incident took place in October of 2014 when she had attempted to assault her sleeping sibling. Emotions ran high in the courtroom as her parents, her intended victims, had asked for mercy. Roxana's family supported her all throughout the proceedings, portraying her as an emotionally broken child with a terrible history. They revealed that she was adopted from Poland and was traumatized before falling under the sway of her manipulative 23-year-old lover. They had questioned her comprehension of the confession, which would be later thrown out, as well as how she had understood the ramifications of her guilty plea and the plea deal itself. Her mother voiced worries about her daughter's knowledge of the plea agreement and the intentions of her present counsel. The family's hired attorney had intended to launch an appeal questioning the juvenile's knowledge and using it as a potential test case to challenge Michigan's right to try juveniles as adults. And as she heard her sentence, Roxana began to weep. She then expressed regret for her actions. The defense would go on to argue that Roxana's psychological damage stemming from her experiences in the Polish orphanage and her biological family had combined with external influence, which led to the unfortunate turn of events. Number 5. Number 6. Jaleel Smith Riley Jaleel Smith Riley had taken the life of a young lady and badly injured her partner in 2003 and would be sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. The families involved in the case had expressed mixed feelings, claiming that the long-awaited judgment was both inadequate and untimely. The sentencing session would be packed with emotional outbursts, resulting in Smith Riley falling down at one point. Despite his attempts to retract his guilty plea and have the death penalty removed as a possibility, the judge, Charles Q. Becky, would dismiss the request and impose the maximum punishment. While Smith Riley's family pled for a lenient sentence, citing his lack of criminal history prior to that fateful night, along with their belief in his potential for rehab, the families of the victims, Portia Brooks and Aaron Martin, would plead for the harshest punishment possible. Portia Brooks's mother stated that she believed that Smith Riley had taken the life of her daughter, and it was now time for her family to begin the path towards peace. She admitted that the road ahead would be difficult, but that she was determined to continue forward, along with the aid of her family and in memory of her daughter. Smith Riley's counsel would state at the hearing that he had never seen a client seek to retract a guilty plea in a criminal trial. He had counseled against it, recognizing the gravity of the allegations and the gravity of the implications. The family exited the courtroom with mixed feelings as the procedures were completed. The punishment was a critical step toward closure and healing for the victims' families. Number 7. Jennifer Mee Jennifer Mee, often known as the Hiccup Girl, would be found guilty of taking the life of a 22-year-old man in a dramatic courtroom scene and faced life in prison without the chance of release. As the decision would be delivered, she began to cry, and family members from both sides stormed out of the courtroom, crying and expressing their sadness. Her mother, obviously disturbed, was unable to see the decision, but when she entered the courtroom, she saw her daughter in tears, and although, according to her, she was not the one who drew the gun, the jury found her guilty of first-degree murder. Prosecutors said that she planned the crime and even enticed others into a botched heist. She had hoped for a lower charge, but instead was facing life in prison. The victim's mother spoke to the media about her grief, reiterating that no matter what had happened, it would never bring her son back. She wanted the attention to remain on the victim of the horrible crime. She also said that her journey to justice had been long and tough, further expressing gratitude to the state for its aid. Jennifer's mother's sorrow was palpable as she exited the courthouse, flanked by family members. Despite attempts by reporters to question her, she had declined to speak. Defense attorney John Trevina, who defended Jennifer, likewise declined to make any remarks on the case. The possibility of spending the rest of her whole life in prison with no chance of release had hung over her. The trial and its conclusion were key turning points in this tale, providing closure to some and reviving wounds for others. Number 8. Shondell Jackson Nathan Potter, age 21, passed away after Shondell Jackson had assaulted him with a firearm during a robbery attempt. 
Potter was targeted by Jackson and his accomplice, Derek J. Thomas, despite the fact that he had no money. Jackson would be found guilty of the assault and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of her. To the outburst, his counsel had appealed to the judge to take Jackson's youth and lack of impulse control into account while considering sentencing. The courtroom drama eclipsed the plea as Jackson's family members mocked the victim's bereaved family from the back of the courtroom, spewing out vitriol and creating further suffering. The Potter family's emotional toll was obvious. Nathan's 13-year-old sister Sarah had expressed her concerns during the brawl, assuming that someone was attempting to harm her parents. She wept as she recalled her brother as a loving and caring person, regretting the restless nights that had followed his death. Number 9. David Myers A horrible act would be committed by a Buffalo youngster. David Myers, age 19, stood before Justice Christopher Burns, clothed in orange and handcuffed at the waist. His attorney would state that Myers was cooperative, providing a full confession to the police detectives. Myers pled guilty to the most serious charges of second-degree arson and confessed that he had taken the life of 52-year-old Brian Dominic, setting fire to his South Buffalo home. He addressed the court, admitting his responsibility and expressing regret for his conduct. He said there was nothing he could do to fully atone for his actions and voiced a somber yearning to turn back time and reverse the heinous things that he had done. However, he recognized the impossibility of such a request. During the trial, it would be discovered that Myers and Dominic had been arguing before the deadly meeting. The motivation for the crime then began to emerge, giving insight into the circumstances before the fatal catastrophe. As sentencing came to a close, the scale of his actions became clear. Justice Christopher Burns handed down the sentence, life in state prison with a minimum penalty of 20 years. Myers was extremely distraught as he addressed the judge. The gravity of his actions as well as the repercussions that he would now face were apparent. The community would be left baffled by the horrific nature of the crime, and the punishment did provide some closure, but the impact of the senseless act of violence will be felt by all who were affected indefinitely. Number 10. Aiden Von Grebo Aiden Von Grebo, a 15-year-old child, took the life of Michaela Grody by assaulting her with a knife in an apartment where she lived with her family in November of 2017. This tragic incident would shake the neighborhood, leaving everyone looking for answers and justice. Authorities apprehended Von Grebo only hours after the crime, Multiple witnesses would positively identify him as the assailant, putting him at the scene. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, the district attorney's office would move quickly to file charges against Von Grebo, arguing that he should be prosecuted as an adult. The judge agreed, and that launched a high-stakes court struggle. His destiny would hang in the balance as he faced various charges, each of them carrying hefty consequences, and eventually he would be sentenced to life in prison. In an unexpected turn of events, Von Grebo's legal team would embark on an innovative defense approach, blaming an unlikely suspect, Accutane, a potent acne treatment. Accutane's turbulent history gives credence to their thesis. Over the years, the medication has been linked to a multitude of issues, with some claiming that it could trigger depression, aggressiveness, and even insanity. However, using Accutane as a defense in his case did not work out. And all throughout the trial, Von Grebo displayed very little remorse for his actions. His demeanor exhibited more fear of the impending sentence than genuine remorse for the life that he had taken. Number 11. Gavin Ramsey A hunt for answers in Wadsworth, Ohio would lead to a tragic discovery. Howard Leisure examined his 98-year-old aunt's home in April of 2018, seeking to unearth clues regarding her whereabouts. A shiver would rush down his spine as he unlocked the closet in search of his aunt's cherished shoes, and inside, Margaret Douglas's dead body would be found connected to a single shoe. Ramsey would be convicted of strangling Douglas in January of 2019, a crime that would forever taint that quiet neighborhood. Recognizing the gravity of his conduct, the court sentenced him to life in prison without the prospect of release. When he had heard his sentence, his eyes welled up with tears, and he began to bite his jaw out of nervousness. The Douglas family consented to take part in the event in order to bring attention to pending legislation at the time. They sought to raise awareness about the elimination of life in prison without the possibility of release for teenagers who are guilty of major offenses, but unfortunately those efforts were for naught because the act was passed. 
Wadsworth Police Chief Randy Rinke called the Douglas case the most horrible crime he had ever seen and witnessed in his 28-year tenure. He couldn't fathom the wickedness that would inspire Ramsey to commit such a horrific crime and characterized it as a mysterious darkness, a terrifying force that gripped a young man's spirit. Gavin's mother, Christine, would recount her son's mental health difficulties and her efforts to seek aid through counseling and medicine during the trial. Ramsey had alarmingly described his objectives in a notebook, and so she believed her aunt was only a warm-up for the possible future victims. Number 12. Raceland Martin 17-year-old Raceland Martin went before Superior Court Judge James Ammons in a Cumberland County because he took the life of his grandfather, Joseph Emmett Nalty. This horrible action, committed with a hatchet, stunned the entire town. Martin had accepted responsibility for his crimes and pleaded guilty to first-degree murder. Despite the fact that he was a juvenile at the time of the crime, prosecutors chose to try him as an adult in court to seek justice for his horrible deeds. Given the facts, the judge had power to impose a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of release. However, understanding the defendant's age at the time, being 17, he elected to allow him parole after 25 years. During sentencing, Martin clearly bound and overcome with grief, sobbed as prosecutors brutally revealed the degree of his grandfather's injuries. The courtroom would be full of astonishment and fear. Martin began to shiver as he lifted a cup to sip some water. The defense counsel would try to portray a distressing picture of neglect and instability in an attempt to shed light on familial relationships. Martin's parents would be accused of abandoning him for years, forcing him to fend for himself. The young child would seek consolation in gloomy books and serial criminal stories, which he integrated into his homeschooling education. His immaturity, mental instability, and peer pressure all played key roles in his conduct, according to his defense. As the procedures in court would make progress, it became clear that the dynamics inside of the family played a key role in the tragedy. And finally, the judge imposed a sentence that weighed the gravity of the offense against the defendant's age at the time. Number 13. Conrad Schaefer Conrad Schaefer experienced the repercussions of his conduct when he was sentenced to life in prison at the age of 18. He was involved in the heinous incidents that took the lives of two innocent people in 2013. The sad chain of events began when Schaefer tragically shot David Guerrero, who was innocently on his way to catch a bus to work. The brutality didn't end there, though. Schaefer then went on to commit a home invasion with three other friends, and it was there that his actions became even more heinous as he took the life of another individual. Schaefer entered a plea of guilty, paving the way for his punishment. Although he had faced up to 40 years in prison, the judge imposed an even harsher sentence, two consecutive life sentences. Schaefer issued a pathetic apology to the relatives of his victims in the courtroom who were overwhelmed with tears. He expressed contrition for his actions, acknowledging the wrongness. However, in the eyes of the victims' families, his apology would fall short, leaving them with an inexplicable hole that could never be filled. The victim's aunt would voice her own sadness, wishing for a moment when Schaefer could genuinely comprehend the suffering that he had caused. Prosecutor Jeff Ashton reiterated the family's comments, emphasizing the need to keep Schaefer locked up in order to safeguard the community. As the weight of the punishment fell upon him, Schaefer lowered his head, plainly stunned and overwhelmed with guilt. Investigators would discover that Schaefer had gotten his father to buy him a rifle and ammunition. Testimony from his mother would emphasize his early problems with leukemia, implying that it had hardened him and increased his temper throughout his formative years. While his father suffered legal penalties for his involvement, including jail time and probation, it would be Conrad Schaefer who eventually paid the ultimate price. Number 14. Shanita Cunningham Shanita Cunningham and her accomplice, Erica Butts, bore the repercussions of their horrible crimes that took the life of a child, Serenity Richardson. Their life sentences left no question about the gravity of their crimes. As the details of Serenity's horrific story would emerge, the courtroom would fall silent. Butts and Cunningham had subjected Serenity to acts of brutality, and an assistant managing solicitor, Elizabeth Gordon, was at a loss for words. During the trial, it was discovered that the incident took place over a two-week period. According to the criminals, the reason for the assault was Serenity's toilet accident. However, the extent of the victim's injury demonstrated that the pair were fully aware of the result of their actions. 
They began to hyperventilate and collapsed to the floor shortly after being sentenced to life in prison, with family members crying out in pain. Both of the criminals had to be escorted out of the courtroom. Elizabeth Gordon, the seasoned prosecutor, having watched several atrocities against vulnerable people, declared this to be the worst one that she had ever witnessed. The punishment of life in prison conveyed a clear message that such horrible crimes would never go unpunished. Number 15. Dylan Shoemaker Dylan Shoemaker, 16 years old at the time, would be given the responsibility for his girlfriend's two small sons while she worked a night shift at a nearby restaurant. As the evening progressed, an unspeakable nightmare would unfold within the walls of their humble home. Shoemaker took the life of his girlfriend's child, Austin, who was about to celebrate his second birthday. He would be arrested and brought to court, and the trial that followed showed a complicated web of emotion. When Shoemaker would be charged with second degree, he continued staring at the walls, kicking his feet and sobbing loudly, as he never intended to harm Austin, whom he had professed to loving greatly. However, the tears, an attempt to sway the jury's feelings, had failed to persuade State Supreme Court Justice M. William Bowler. Bowler had called him a manipulator and deceiver who would face a consequence of his conduct in a stinging rebuke. The punishment would be handed down 25 years to life in prison. However, justice may take unforeseen twists and turns. In February of 2016, the Court of Appeals would issue an unpopular judgment in order to reduce his sentence to 18 years to life, providing some hope for his eventual freedom. However, even if released, the state's careful eye will stay fixated on him, ensuring that he remains under control. Dylan Shoemaker, now 26 years old, has been imprisoned for nine years and considers the weight of his actions and their irreparable harm wrought while confined in the intimidating walls of the Clinton Correctional Facility in New York. What do you think about these teenage criminals and the sentences they were given? Let me know about it in the comments below. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more like it in the future, and I'll see you next time.